Hello, I'm Frances Deegan Horowitz, President of the City University Graduate Center. Welcome to Women to Women, a series of programs for and about us. I'm so delighted to welcome a former colleague of mine from the University of Kansas, Jacqueline Z. Davis, to the program today. She is the Executive Director of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. That branch is both a circulating and a research library and has an extraordinary collection of collections, which we'll learn about in a moment. Welcome. It's good to have you here. It's so nice to see you um, here, Francis. We should uh, talk a little bit about Kansas. Great, great. Uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is south of Buffalo, New York. And where did you go to school? Well, I went to a couple of places. I went to Dunbarton College, Holy Cross, and Washington, D.C., where I then worked afterwards in the Senate. And then uh, I went to the University of Kansas, where I got a master's degree in French literature. And in between, um, I have a couple of degrees uh, from l'Institut Catholique in Paris, France, so that I could enhance my French speaking. <laughs> Um, so did you go to Kansas to take the degree or you went there because? I was then married and uh, my former husband was going to be at the law school and we had both been work. I was working in the Senate. He was working in the House of Representatives when we met. And he had had some idea of running for Congress, which he didn't end up doing, as you know, he was dean of law. So we um, went out and I remember after a year saying to him, you know, you brought me out here and you were worried because I had never lived in the Midwest and I could see myself living here forever. I loved it so much. Yes, well, there. Lawrence, Kansas, as we both very know, special. it's a very special place. Yeah, it really is. How did you get into arts administration? Well, I had, because I had worked in the Senate, I had done um, a fair amount of um, gathering people together for any kind of rally or doing some fundraising for the senator. And those things kind of translated. When I got to Kansas, I met uh, the now president of the University of North Carolina, Jim Meeser, right. your colleague and mine. And we began talking about things that I wanted to do. I grew up dancing, singing, doing theater um, just as a kid and loved it. I mean, it was my first love. And when we met and I talked to him, at some point he said, I'm really interested in you looking at this position. And it was tough in the beginning because I knew the art, but I certainly didn't know the practicalities. And it was interesting trying to gather all of that together. I don't think most people think of arts administration as a career track. Had you thought it would be that for you? Once I got into it, I knew it was going to be a career track. But when I was doing it, it was 1980, 1980 actually, um, there, were, there was no formal program except there were a couple, of one in, in Madison, Wisconsin for arts administration. And we were really learning uh, by the seat of our pants. And things have changed now. There are degrees in arts administration. But uh, no, I had certainly never thought of it as I was growing up, certainly not when I was going through college. And thinking about a master's degree in French literature and then going into something that was so different. Um, who knew? I, there I was with this degree and doing something different and very exciting. As you know, it was an amazing program. And what, what exactly is arts administration? How would you define it? Well, in the case of presenting the performing arts, it is uh, taking a, uh, a series of programs uh, determining what they're going to be, doing all the research, making sure the marketing is in place, making sure all the backstage issues are, are taken care of, including all the technical issues, being able to read light plots or be trusting of someone who can read them and not order too many things, uh, having a box office that works. And so you're really talking about management skills as well as marketing and uh, statistics and a range of things. And since I couldn't do all that, I gathered people around me who could help. But now this is a major career track for people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for museum as well as for um, performing arts programs. And did you ever think you would end up in the New York Public Library as an arts administrator? No, in fact, there's, a, there's actually a story behind that. Um, I had been thinking, um, you know, you get to a point it's in your career where you say, all right, is, is this it or are, shall I be doing something different? and uh, life circumstances had changed and I, I began wondering. And a letter came to me from a search firm which I threw in the waste paper basket 
And for some reason, there was something, I don't know, some instinct that said, pick it up. I picked it up and I read it and it said Library for the Performing Arts. I went through everything. But when I got to the bottom and described the kind of person they wanted, they wanted somebody really who had been very much involved in the performing arts field as I was. And I ended up calling the uh, search firm saying, this doesn't look like something that I'm credentialed to do, but your description of who you want is who I am, if that makes sense. So then all of a sudden I was in a long interview on the phone telling my life story. Then I was flown to Chicago to chat with them. And after 20 minutes, they basically turned me around to Kansas City and said, we want you in New York. I was so certain that this was not just exactly a match. I said, I won't let them pay to send me. <laughs> I have to do it myself because i just not sure this will match. And I was in uh, then President Nat Leventhal's office, uh, President of Lincoln Center, the night before the interview and said, I don't. I just don't think this is a match. And he said, you have to go to the interview. If you decide it's not a match after that, then you just tell them. I got in the interview, and all the conversation was just so exciting and showed me immediately that my knowledge of the performing arts, uh, the opportunity to stretch because of the museum activity. We had two gallery spaces. And the little theater that is quite active, about 90 events a year, Brunewald Auditorium, would be a good fit. And, and I'm, I'm, it's now four and a half years later, and I'm still there, so I guess it is. But you came to essentially a library, and you're not a librarian. Absolutely. Was that a problem? Uh, I think it could have been if I had been surrounded by people who were not interested in making it and me successful. The curators in music, dance, theater, recorded sound, circulating, all sort of banded together, and uh, anything I needed to know they helped me with it. Uh, in fact, I remember Howard Dodson, who's my colleague from Schomburg, saying to me a couple of years ago, he's, he, and this is a great compliment, he said, you're growing leaps and bounds. I mean, you're in there discussing <laughs> deaccessioning and recap and <laughs> other library terms. I, I've made a huge effort to um, be able to understand and to work within that milieu. And I think something, I don't know if it's a gene or whether it's just... I don't think it's a gene. Okay, it's, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> it's your area. Um, I'm not afraid to say I don't know what that means, usually. And that helped me when I started the Career and Arts Administration and was dealing with so many artist managers who were talking about Sasha Schneider or other people, and I might not know who that was and would have to say so. And when I moved on to library, um, obviously I did a lot of research, but. Um, it helped a great deal, but I'm not afraid to step in that way. So. You're, you're at Lincoln Center, but you're part of the New York Public Library. Do you have two bosses? No. <laughs> What's enough? No, I work for um, the vice president, the Mellon vice president for the research libraries. There are four research centers, as you know. And uh, <laughs> I, I do have another hat, though, which is that I sit on Lincoln Center Council with all the other heads of um, of um, Lincoln Center constituency. So Joel Volpe uh, for the Metropolitan Opera, for example, and Zarin Major from um, New York Philharmonic. We all get together with uh, Ren Levy, the president of Lincoln Center. We try to get together once a month and discuss common issues and how we can work together on uh, anything from marketing to what's going on that we can do some crossover. So that's a, that's a very good relationship for me. And in terms of this as part of the New York Public Library. Was it established de novo as part of the New York Public Library at Lincoln Center, or was it originally part of the 42nd Street branch? When um, the library began, of course, there was music, dance, and theater. And as I understand from my colleagues, there were all these corners that had dance books and music, and music was huge and theater, uh, when Lincoln Center was built, it was built immediately with the idea of the library. So there was an understanding that there was a real interest and that there was a need and that this would make the most sense. Now the library serves more than Lincoln Center constituency, of course. It serves the entire city, if not, well in fact it serves internationally. Uh, we have so many people coming through, 30,000 a month. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all the collections in music and dance 
were moved theater. and theater were moved to the Lincoln Center site right. and recorded sound. The four divisions are uh, music, dance, theater, recorded sound, and then the circulating division has all of that. And but at what point, or maybe it already happened, was there this push, which seems to be very strong, to bring in collections of producers and, and various kinds of performing artists to the library? I think it, it was, thus it always was, but if you were to look at what you just described, uh, that, that interest, that attention was really enhanced once there was this move to this visible building at Lincoln Center because it was, it says, the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, and all of a sudden the artist community had a home. I mean, because one of the things that you would know because we've worked together is for me and for all of us, that building is much more than a library. It's mm -hmm. a center. It's a, it's a living, breathing entity that's about bringing in people who are uh, not only artists, but critics and scholars and lifelong learners. And it's a place where you can really, uh, there's a synergy that's very exciting about it. And I, because it is a building, because it is identifiable, then people can get to it. And I think that created it. And of course, those conversations go on all the time with the artists about bringing their collections. And what are the, some of the major collections since you've been there that have come to the library? Oh, gosh. Uh, the um, Robert Wilson collection uh, of his, uh, of, of his uh, videos and film, over 1,500 tapes that are being processed right now. It's very exciting to us. Um, uh, Candor and Ebb, Harnick and Bach was a recent acquisition, which is really exciting. So those are, those are some of the major ones, and then, of course, a number of them that we hope to obtain in the future. Do, they, are, do you have to buy these? Are they given? There's a combination. Uh, they're usually given. Uh, sometimes, um, as with the Robert Wilson collection, a number of generous people gave funding not to buy, but to help us process a collection in a timely manner so that we can get it available, accessible to the public. That's the key, of course, processing it. Is. it. Uh, otherwise, yeah. it's not available uh, to the public. Who uses the library? The library is used by so many different kinds of people. Um, I think it's important to know that, um, which surprised me, there are fewer than 20% books, so start there. So you're looking at a very exciting place, it's about the performing arts, that includes um, scripts and compositions and uh, set designs, costume designs. I mean, we should wander through some time in the, in the backstage, as I call it. The people who come through would be critics, scholars, um, the artists of every brand. And, 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 a, and a very significant number of those people. And then just the lifelong learners, and then uh, also the, the schools around. Juilliard, of course, uses it, and the, um, um, all the different high schools that are related to the performing arts, uh, LaGuardia, across the street, et cetera. So you've got quite a range of people who are coming in to use. The first and second floor, which is circulating, and therefore you can borrow. Then a smaller number who are on the third floor in the music, dance, and theater, and recorded sound divisions. Uh, one of um, a common benefactor, Lucille Lortel, yes. who, who endowed the chair in theater here, um, <laughs> she, she uh, gave money for this marvelous project of videotaping theater performances that would then create kind of an archive of major theater productions. Which won a Tony Award a couple of years ago for its contribution to the theater community. I was, I was new then, and it was such a thrill to know the significance of that, um, what happened. About 35 years ago, the wonderful Betty Corwin went to all the different unions, and it was not easy, to, as, I, as the story is told to me, to convince everyone that it was to the benefit of the entire theater community to be able to tape on and off Broadway in some regional theater. So she was able to convince them and thus began the tapings. Now the archive has over 5,000 of these and, and uh, we can't tape everything by any means, uh, but there's quite an impressive number of these tapes. And those people who are a part of the theater community who need to see the tapes for whatever reason 
marching there on a daily basis. It's a very popular place. In order to, let's just say you're, um, uh, you're going to make a, a film and somebody was just on Broadway and you want to get a sense of how that person moves, well, you're going to make an appointment and go into theater on film and tape archive and look at it. Uh, apparently, a couple of doctors were trying to assess the damage from um, smoke on stage and uh, went in to watch the tapes to see what the response was from uh, the actors. So there's a there are a variety of reasons why people use it, but the primary reason, of course, is to be able to look at sets, costumes, direction, um, acting. Yes, if I want to do a revival of a play, exactly. I would come in and maybe see the tape of its original production. Absolutely. When Angels in America was made for HBO, um, Mike Nichols and his entire team went in to look at the theater uh, productions many, many times to talk about what they wanted to keep and what they wanted to change. And if I'm just an ordinary patron and I want to look at one of these tapes, I can do that? You cannot do that. And that, I think, was the way Betty Corwin was able to get this to happen. Uh, there was a real fear that people would say, I, I don't want to spend the money to go to the theater, therefore I'll just go to the library and watch it the way I watch TV or a movie. And so the protection is that there has to be a reason related to your work that allows you to go in to see the tapes in the special room called the Lucille Lartel Room. And what, what, where is, is the Performing Arts Library in this whole march to digitalization? to putting everything on tape, to put it on the internet, to give remote access. Is, are you involved in that? We're very much involved in it. Um, we're having discussions all the time. The biggest difficulty is um, finding the funding to be able to do it. Uh, we're, we're very interested in, in accessibility, and I spend a lot of time dealing with it. We just received a major grant uh, in October from the uh, Mellon Foundation, and as a result of that, I'm deep into a needs analysis for moving image and dance, and have six groups meeting twice from around the country to talk about this issue. What are the needs? What will the usages be? How can we make the information more accessible? Probably the biggest roadblock right now is trying to figure out how to deal with the copyright issues. Right, the rights issue. Right. But um, do you worry that? Um, if one day everything's, I can, I can visit this library from my computer, that no one will go? No. Uh, I, I, that question comes up all the time. I think some people do. I don't know if it's because I'm four and a half years old in it and not 40 years old, and I have people who are, uh, have that tradition and they're marvelous. Um, I think it's because I understand that we have to change with the times, and we have to look at what the needs are. At the same time, there, there's a real difference between sitting in front of a screen looking at Beethoven's Archduke Trio draft in Beethoven's hand, and you're looking at a screen and so you're seeing the notes. So I suppose that's interesting. But I've held it in my hands. In fact, Paul Katz, the former um, cellist with the Cleveland Quartet, I took him in, on one of those backstage walks. And he was standing there holding this, going, ba -bum -bum -bum, which I can't do that well. And he said, oh, he changed that here afterwards. It was so exciting, but then he had just had a tear in his eye huh. because he realized what he was holding. And you can't get that from a screen. You can only get that from being there. So there's, the scholarly community is, community is going to want to be there. So there's going to, I think there'll be what a What about the ordinary patron? The ordinary patron who's able to be in New York will come to the library, because no, I, I can't believe, given how many objects we have, I mean, people say nine million, but it's more than that. I, I, there will always be things that, that will have to be seen there. At the same time, I keep thinking about the life I had in Lawrence, Kansas. I was consistently being asked by the theater, music, and dance departments for the tapes I was receiving, because they didn't have access to the new dance that was going on, for example. So when people would send me tapes before I sent them back to management, I gave them to the dance division so they could show them to the students. So an agenda item for me is to take places, people, who simply can't come to the library for the performing arts because they're sitting in, somewhere in the middle of a country or they don't have the money, and to make that accessible to them. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a balance act.
It, it yeah. would be interesting. We won't be here, but 50 and 75 <laughs> years from now <laughs> to have this discussion and to see to what extent technology has changed the basic behavior patterns of, let's say, ordinary patrons. Uh, probably nothing we can actually predict. But No. No, but I, I keep thinking about um, how we were all terrified when videos came out that nobody would ever go to movies. Right. I'm the first one in line, <laughs> line for the first run, so I, I think probably, I don't know, I'm just so positive about this. I'm so anxious for the accessibility. Well, you can so. think of it this way. Technology adds options to life. It doesn't replace anything. Well, that's true. That's very true. Uh, talk a little bit about the um, programmatic aspect of all the exhibitions you're doing and particularly this most recent one, Disco? Well, one of the things I said to you before is that I was interested and was invited to find different pathways into the center. And for me, that meant you, there were already the scholarly folks who were coming in to visit and those who were aware of the building and in a real understanding that there are those who might not be. And I certainly did my own market research to do that, very informal, you know, at dinner asking <laughs> the waiter, have you ever heard of the Performing Arts Library? So, and it had he? It was probably in the arts. Well, that was what was funny. Most, a lot of uh, people are actors, actresses, and um, uh, probably my funniest one was when I said I'm at the Performing Arts Library, and this person could have been 20 and said, I grew up and got older in that library. <laughs> it was, so there's a real connection once people have used it. But the, um, the pathways um, involve making sure that the exhibitions are really top-notch and that they're interesting and they are, have a connection to the collections. In fact, many of them come almost exclusively from within the collections. Um, an example would be uh, the Margot Fontaine exhibit, which was such a success. and. Uh, the Balanchine exhibit that we did with the New York City Ballet and the School of American Ballet. Uh, Joy Brown and Bob Gottlieb curated the Margot Fontaine exhibit. But then moving to the present, that's a little different. Uh, I was visited by two of the curators for Disco, A Decade of Saturday Nights, and they did this exhibit at Experience of Music Project, the Paul Allen Building in Seattle. And they asked if I would come see it because they felt that it was going to be really important to have it in New York since it was about New York. And um, I don't, I, I, I'm busy, but I went. It was another one of those instincts, thou shalt go. So I went and uh, at first I thought, all right, a lot of the work, the research had been done at the Performing Arts Library in the dance division and the music division and recorded sound. So that was already a match. But then <clears throat> as I looked around, there were other issues that I kept finding that made it much more than a story about disco that began underground, that became mainstream, and then it was um, burned in Kaminsky Park in Chicago at some point. So as I looked at some of the social issues that were being depicted, I realized that this had great content and that it would be not only about popular culture, but it included what we have at the library. So we brought it and opened it on January 31st, and the curators asked me to make sure that um, I had all the people who had contributed to it. So it was quite a revelation because all these people started writing to me, telling me they'd help, showed up. It was a family reunion huh. for a lot of people whose names I only knew because they were DJs and they were people involved in the industry. and. Um, so we're, we're having a lot of fun with it. There's so much interest in it. And, and do, do schools bring their classes mm -hmm. to this? Yes. Um, the exhibition's curator has developed a program where uh, schools can call her and bring uh, their students through, and she'll do a presentation for them so that tours go on all the time. And so how, how do you... This, this exhibition came from Seattle, in a sense, mm -hmm. full-blown, but you do ground-up exhibitions. Well, let me mention one. Harold Arlen opened on his birthday, uh, which was February 15th, and will run um, through May. And uh, that exhibition is almost entirely from the library, with a few artifacts that came from Sam Arlen, um, Harold's son. In fact, that's part of the fun of this job. I 
you know, picked up the phone one day and said, Sam, I'm Jackie, and <laughs> can we get together and talk about what we might be able to do with the Ireland exhibition? And it's, it's just, um, it's, in a way, it's otherworldly. It's, it's uh, because you're dealing with people who are part of our history that have had such an impact in the arts community, and um, somehow there is this energy to make a difference to make sure other people know about them. I like that. Well, it's very clear that uh, though you're working very hard, <laughs> you're having a lot of fun. I am. <laughs> I really am. I love New York. I get up in the morning and I go out and I look around and I think, oh, I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> well, Jackie, it's good to see you again. And I'm sorry that we're out of time. My thanks to Jacqueline Z. Davis for joining us. Visit the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at the Lincoln Center. You'll find so many sources of inspiration there. For the City University Graduate Center and Women to Women, I'm Frances Deacon Horowitz. Mm -hmm.